All right, guys, this is a video that I was hoping to make this past summer, but I really wanted to make sure that when I did this video that it was as clear and concise as it could be. And so it took me a while to really summarize all of my thoughts and um, all the different graphs and tables and statistics that I've seen so far. So today we're going to be talking about why the ultimate bear gun is a revolver. And without any further ado, let's jump into a few little TLDR kind of summaries that I've written. So first off and foremost, the best bear gun is the gun that you have on you when a bear attack occurs and that you feel confident using. In addition to this, the best bear gun truthfully is either a shotgun loaded with slugs or a rifle that is capable in caliber and speed and power um, to take down a bear. Those are ultimately every single day, nine times out of 10, probably even 10 times out of 10, the best realistic bear defense. Um, firearms. Now, realistically, the reason why I say a revolver is the best bear defense gun is because starting off with handguns, revolvers, pistols, semi-autos, whatever you'd like to say, realistically, this is most likely what you will have on you when an actual bear attack happens. The reason why is because while we all know that it would be better to have a rifle or a shotgun um, handy when a bear comes to attack you, the reality is rifles and shotguns are bulky, they're hard to carry, and they're just not realistic to have on you as often, as frequently, and as easily. So that's where a really solid handgun comes into play. Now, conventionally, a lot of people, especially now, even people who live in Alaska will tell you 10 mil, primarily Glocks, but semi-autos as a whole, are either their go-to bear guns or what they recommend for bear guns. Now, the reason why I like the revolver, and the revolver does have some distinct advantages, and these primarily, and once again, I'll summarize them, are reliability, stopping power, speed of follow-up shots, simplicity of use or sheer gross motor skills, and lack of magazine release. So those are the key points for the revolver. Now I'm gonna dig into them. So starting off with it, reliability. Some people will largely argue that semi-automatic handguns are more reliable than a revolver, but unfortunately that is just not the case and I will show you why. Now this gun is clear, as you guys see, no ammo in it, but when it comes down to it, this has a very simple function. All you have to do is either pull the hammer back or with a double action revolver, just pull the trigger. That's all it is. The gun literally does everything for you. And most importantly, there are no slides that need a certain amount of recoil. There are no other functions that can really mess this gun up. About the only thing that can stop this gun from firing the next round is if something is jamming the hammer, like this case where I'm trying to pull the trigger, but my thumb is physically holding the hammer back from that. So that's about the only case where this gun would be prevented from firing again. But once again, even if this was pressed up close against me, so long as there is enough room for this hammer to clear, it will go bang. So it is surely more reliable. The next point I will say is magazine releases. And that is that there is no magazine to be released on this handgun. Now, some may say that yes, you have this revolver or this um, cylinder release, and that is true. But once again, it's very hard to actuate. And with a semi-automatic gun, I can have the gun cocked and ready to go and ready to shoot, and the magazine will still drop freely, right? If this handgun's hammer is back like this, I physically cannot depress this, um, I cannot physically depress the cylinder release, right? I cannot get the cylinder to release. So it is really hard to mess it up. Now, the next one is stopping power. Now, this one is slightly arguable because things like I have previously ran, like the Desert Eagle, will run comparable ammunition to the 44 Magnum, but undoubtedly with things like 500 Smith & Wesson, 454 Sewell, or 460 Ruger, there are much higher powered revolver rounds that can be fired. So undoubtedly, stopping power is there. Now the next one I said was speed of follow-up shots. Now this one gets a little bit dicey because some people will argue that their semi-auto is faster to fire again, and that primarily relates to how fast you can shoot your gun, get it back on target, and 
fire the next round. And once again, if a bear is right on top of you, say it is less than five feet away from you, this is a physically faster gun to fire. Once again, being that you're not waiting for the slide or the mass of the slide to travel, you are literally just turning the cylinder again and again, right? You're just turning that cylinder. So this is physically faster, especially especially if you train with a revolver a lot, this is physically faster to fire than a semi-automatic because you do not have the same type of issue with a large piece of metal, namely the slide, cycling, picking up the next round and going into battery. This will just cycle the next cylinder. Now the next one, and I think one that is extremely important because in dire situations, primarily from a psychological basis, the use of gross motor skills cannot be underestimated. Now, once again, what do I mean by the use of gross motor skills? Once again, it kind of goes back to there are no magazine releases to hit, and the only way to get this gun to fire again, and the way to get it to fire again, is simply to pull the trigger. You just have to keep pulling the trigger, and the gun will keep going bang. You don't have to worry about the recoil sapping energy out of the travel of the slide, which would prevent it from going into battery or picking up the next round. You don't have to worry about anything really with this handgun. You just keep pulling that trigger. And moreover, the pull of this trigger is a gross motor skill. You don't have to, you know, use some fine articulate skills. You don't even really have to think about it. You just pull that trigger again. And so that is what I like about revolvers. And I think with double action revolvers, especially, it is a really huge advantage to just be able, I mean, like I said, you don't even have to pull the hammer back you just pull the trigger you know there's none of this you just pull the trigger so it's really a very simplistic thing to do and once again i already mentioned the lack of release and overall i will say the user interface for a revolver there are far less things to press on here i mean just for example i'll pull out my my edc gun here which is hot but on this guy we'll just point it this way is you know you have a magazine release you have a slide release you have a slide that moves obviously the trigger you could potentially have safeties on these things so you can see how many more things there are to press and or potentially mess up in a dire situation with a bear. And so once again, with this guy, there really isn't that. You have a cylinder release on this side, you have a hammer and a trigger. There's really not much here. And once again, pulling back this hammer is completely optional. Now, another point that I do wanna bring up that I don't think is brought up a lot either is what if you hit a dud round? Now, what this means is what if you hit a round and it doesn't go bang, right? Um, this does happen and Lord willing, hopefully you're first never in a situation where you have to defend yourself from a bear. But secondly, if you do find yourself in that, hopefully every round you pull the trigger on goes bang. However, it must be stated that with a revolver as opposed to a semi-auto, if you pull the trigger and nothing happens on a semi-automatic handgun, you have to physically rack the slide or in some way manipulate that handgun, right? Once again, going back to the simplicity of the revolver, if say you pull the trigger, nothing happens, you pull the trigger again, right? There's no delay. I don't have to rack a slide. I don't have to drop a magazine. There's nothing there to be a catch up, right? The gun is physically designed so that it's not contingent on the recoil or the energy of the previous round. So if the first round doesn't go bang, you just pull the trigger again and hopefully it will go bang, right? So that is another huge pro, I think, to the revolver that a lot of people don't talk about is if there is a round that doesn't go bang, the revolver is just going to cycle as per usual, as normal. In fact, you may not even notice it in the moment because you're too busy pulling the trigger, right? So those are some of the biggest reasons why I think a revolver, especially a double action revolver, is the best tool to defend yourself from a bear. Once again, we've established you only do have six rounds as opposed to, you know, 15, 16 rounds of a 10 millimeter Glock um, 20 or other uh, alternatives. So you are limited in capacity, but I think something that's really important to note and something that I did with um, one of my YouTube friends here in Alaska is we did a bear charge with the Desert Eagle. And, you know, we 
we took that Desert Eagle, tested it against a charging bear, and obviously the simulator definitely had its faults. It was not perfect. I think a lot of people fail to understand that I am definitely well aware that that is a simulation and not a real charging bear. There are obvious discrepancies, right? But at the same time, too, what it did give you a really good representation of is what is it like to have a bear-sized object charging you at roughly you know 20 miles an hour and in those cases even with the desert eagle uh you know in most semi-auto handguns as a whole you might get five rounds off um, I was getting, I think, three to four rounds off with the Desert Eagle, and that was still pretty good for 50 AE, I will say. But, um, you know, realistically, the amount of rounds that you're going to get off with a revolver will not be severely different than a semi-automatic. Um, once again, I think, too, the big thing will be training more than anything, because if you train a lot with a revolver and you feel confident and competent with a revolver, you're going to do much better than someone who's predominantly a semi-automatic person or someone who trains predominantly with semi-automatic handguns, because there is a difference in how you use them how you respond to recoil and you know the overall um, user interface. So it is important to note that, but I do think revolvers do have a lot of merit for them in this type of regard. Now, of course, human self-defense is a little bit different and that's obviously why I EDC a you know Glock 19, right? Um, it's a little bit different when we're talking about fighting you know another person as opposed to fighting a bear. Um, but anywho, um, but anyways, so going on to it, the last thing I will say that I think a lot of people um, miss when it comes to 10 mil versus 44 or other larger calibers is that a lot of people oftentimes kind of either fantasize or think that because they have 15, 16 rounds of 10 mil that, you know, they basically do the math equation of how much stopping power each round is multiplied by 15 or 16, right? Then they get this huge number and they're like, well, this is how much stopping power I have in my handgun. How much does yours have? And obviously, while the sheer stopping power of a 44 is greater than a four, uh, 10 mil, um, you know, together 16 of the stopping powers of 10 mil is greater than six of the stopping powers of 44. And this is true, but characteristically, when we test things on ballistic gelatin and even in real life and practice, um, you know, when you shoot something, you're doing an individual damage or let's say, you know, feet of penetration, right? Each bullet is individually going to penetrate to a certain degree or depth. And so when it comes to something like a 44 or a 44 Kasul, you know, you are going to see about three feet, three and a half feet of penetration depth on a good round, um, like any of your bear defense rounds, right? And so that's each individual round is penetrating roughly three to three and a half feet into the animal. Um, and so when you look at that, that's really what you need to be considering is what is the actual ballistic performance of each and every round? Because it's not a homologated damage that you're going to do. Like oftentimes in video games, you know, you have to do so much damage to say a boss, right? And each one of your attacks does X amount of damage, right? So if you hit them a bunch of times, your damage stacks to that greater number. However, in real life, um, with animals, it does not work that way. You can shoot an animal multiple times, and if you don't shoot it in the correct spot, or if the round fails to achieve the proper depth to go into vital organs, it's not going to be an effective shot. The damage doesn't compound or stack up. So I, I want to dispel this myth as well that, um, you know, having more rounds is always better because it is better if you miss a lot and then you still have rounds to hit your target with. But outside of that, having more rounds, like say having 10,000 pound feet of energy is not necessarily better than 6,000 pound feet of energy if each round individually only does, you know, um, if each round only does so much. Like if it's only, you know, putting out, let's say five to 600 foot pounds of energy, having that much is not greater. So that's something that, like I said, I've, I've seen a lot of YouTubers use that metric. And it's certainly a very catchy metric on YouTube because people say like, wow, man, that guy's carrying so much ballistic energy in his, you know, magazine of his handgun. I want that. And it's just, once again, when we actually put it up against real ballistic gelatin targets, when we put it up against real life, you know, actual situations, we know for a fact that damage is not compounding. It's singular upon the, sing the shot that you take. Um, 
to an extent. Now, of course, once again, if you burst one lung with one shot and you burst the other lung with another shot, of course, that will compound damage. But once again, each round is individually doing its own damage. So I want to make that, and hopefully that kind of clears that up. I, I know it's kind of complicated to explain, but I wanted to kind of hammer in that point. Um, lastly, um, to all the people who choose to still run 10 millimeter and believe in lesser calibers or semi-automatic handguns, you know, ultimately at the core of the day, uh, or at the end of the day, the core of the message is really, like I said at the beginning of this video, the best bear defense handgun that you have is the one that you have on your body at the time that you need it, and the one that you feel the most capable and competent with. Um, because if you don't have the confidence or the competence to, you know, use your gun effectively, then it doesn't really matter what you have. You could have, you know, a four shot or you have a six shot 44 Magnum. You could have a 16 shot 10 mil. But if you miss your target every shot, then you're really not going to do anything. So regardless to what gun you decide to run for bear defense, um, you know, train with it so that you're competent enough to use it when the time comes and, uh, yeah, hopefully this has been a, you know, articulate enough argument to the value of the revolver. Because personally, this is what I go to for my bear defense. And I think that 44 mag revolvers strike a really good balance of being controllable enough for most people, but yet effective enough for most targets. And so that's kind of the reason why I land on 44 Magnum. I have shot 44 Kasul. I think it's just fine. It pushes me around quite a bit because I don't weigh a lot, but uh, um, it's certainly like I can shoot them competently as well. But yeah, so anyways, guys, that is my ultimate kind of talking point on bear defense handguns. Hopefully you find this handy. Hopefully you guys stay safe in the wilderness around bear country because it is important. And hopefully you learned at least something about it. something interesting and new in this video. As always, God bless and I'm out.